Good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. Thank you for joining us today as we make history with the very first council hearing focused especially on age discrimination in the workplace, held jointly by the Committee on Aging and the Committee on Civil Rights, Civil and Human Rights. I would like to thank my co-chair, Councilmember Eugene, for his sheer commitment to this issue and his ongoing work to fight for the rights of all New Yorkers. Councilmember Eugene uh, will be joining us later. Age discrimination in the workplace is an issue that happens much too often, but isn't talked about enough. Its impact not only on seniors, but many older adults over the age of 50. According to the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, age discrimination involves treating an applicant or employee less favorably because of his or her age. Sadly, and too frequently, older adults are victims of this form of discrimination in the workplace. In fact, during fiscal year 2017, age discrimination accounted for more than 20% of the complaints made to the EEOC with over 18,000 total complaints filed. Like those throughout the country, older New Yorkers in New York City are often victimized by age discrimination. In a 2013 AARP survey given to New York City voters aged 15 and older, half of respondents indicated that they have experienced or witnessed age discrimination in the workplace or while searching for a job. Of those responded, 28% believed they were not hired for a job due to their age. 27% indicated that they were urged to retire before they preferred to. And 23% stated they were laid off, terminated, or have been pushed out of their job since 20, turning 50 years old. Age discrimination in the workplace manifests in a variety of ways. It could mean being passed over for a raise or promotion, being denied access to training opportunities, being targeted for layoffs and firing, despite being rated as high performers, being denied the support needed to decide whether one has been subjected to age discrimination and being denied opportunities to get ahead until one feels they have no other choice but to retire, regardless of whether or not they are financially ready to retire. With older adults increasing in New York City workforce, taking action to address this issue is more urgent than ever. According to a 2017 report released by New York City Comptroller Scott Stringer, from 2005 to 2015, the number of older workers increased by 62%. And research showed that the number of adults deciding to work past their retirement age has been increasing since the 90s. By 2020, one-fourth of American workers will be 55 or older. Staying in the workplace provides many benefits for seniors and employers. For example, according to a U.S. Senate report, older workers are more likely than younger workers to report that their job provides personal fulfillment and a sense of being needed and value, as well as opportunity to learn new skills and remain physically cognitively and socially active. Working also helps improve cognitive function, let older workers feel less isolated, and provide them with financial stability. For employers, older workers are also beneficial because research suggests that older workers are actually generally more productive because of their high levels of organization, commitment and loyalty. We must also recognize the population of older workers who for economic security reasons are forced to continue working and save for retirement or accrue social security benefits. According to a study released this year 
from the Consumer Bankruptcy Project, the rate of people 65 and older filing for bankruptcy is three times the rate in 1991. Recognizing the benefits of senior employment, the Department for the Aging, DIFTA, <laughs> provides many services to help older adults find jobs. These services include the senior employment services, which help seniors receive employment in administrative work, customer service, home care, and other fields. The reserve program, which matches retirees with short-term New York City agency projects and a home health aid referral program, which partners with 12 healthcare agencies that are interested in employing older adults. While DIFTA has employment service to help seniors gain employment, the New York City Commission on Human Rights investigate all allegations of age discrimination in the workplace. However, I would like to acknowledge that fighting age discrimination in the workplace is not the responsibility of just one city agency, but the responsibility of all city agencies. Our city's older workers are among the most experienced and knowledgeable workers in New York City and serve as valuable access to the workforce. It is extremely important that we protect them from unfair and illegal discrimination. Today's hearing will provide opportunity for DIFTA and the City Commission on Human Rights to concerns raised about age discrimination in the workplace as well as for union, unionized employees, advocates, and other stakeholders to share their concerns and recommendations related to protecting our older workers from age discrimination. I'd like to thank the community staff for their help in organizing this hearing. Uh, Council, Nusa Chodori, Policy Analyst, Kalima Johnson. I also would like to thank my legislative director, Mariam, Guerra, and most importantly, aid justice advocates like Bobby Sackman for their tireless work to shed light on this issue. And I also like to thank the other members of the Committee Aging who have joined us here today. Um, we have Council Member Diaz, uh, who's been here all day, and Council Member Ayala. And we also have uh, Council Member Traeger on the committee. Uh, Council Member Drum and also joined by Council Member Lander from the Civil Rights Committee. And, uh, oh, Council Member Malone, my partner. <laughs> Didn't see you all again. Uh, so now I will ask uh, our council to uh, administer the oath. Uh, can we invite the first panel? <laughs> from DIFTA and the uh, City Commission on Human Rights. Um, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. I do. Good afternoon, Chair Chin, Chair Eugene, and members of the Aging and Civil Human Rights Committees. I'm Karen Resnick, De Deputy Commissioner for the New York City Department for the Aging. On behalf of Commissioner Corrado, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony on the important subject of age discrimination in the workplace. Combating ageism has long been an important part of our work at DIFTA. Over the past several years, we've hosted multiple public forums, trainings, and presentations on ageism awareness and prevention. It was not, however, until 2013, at the onset of Dr. Corrado's tenure as DIFTA's commissioner, that combating ageism formally became a guiding principle. Today, our mission, in part, is to work to eliminate ageism and ensure the dignity and quality of life of New York City's diverse older adults. Our unwavering commitment to the 1.4 million New Yorkers over the age of 60 is accomplished through our collaborative partnerships with hundreds of community-based organizations across the city for the provision of needed programs and critical services. 
As you know, such programs and services include 249 senior centers located across the city, 4.49 million meals delivered annually to homebound seniors, and 528,000 hours of case management services provided each year. In addition to overseeing our geriatric mental health initiative, national, naturally occurring retirement communities, and social adult daycare programs, DIFTA also provides home care services, elder abuse resources, and caregiver assistance. In FY18, DIFTA provided these and a whole host of other essential services to nearly 228,000 older New Yorkers. These include services rendered through our Senior Employment Services Unit, which oversees the Title V Senior Community Service Employment Program, or CSEP. Through this federal grant-funded program, seniors over the age of 55 who meet income eligibility requirements can access training and job placement assistant, assistance while earning a wage. The CSEP program has partnership contracts with more than 400 community-based organizations, nonprofits, and city government agencies to serve as community work sites where applicants can be placed for up to four years. Our job development staff are also working with 300 business entities to facilitate unsubsidized employment of our participants. These partnerships allow us to provide real-life professional training opportunities to participants while supplying invaluable services to our partner employers. Home health aid, security guard, administrative assistant, substitute teacher, maintenance worker, and hospital patient navigator are among the most common job types available through the program. In FY18, nearly 450 Title V participants were placed in community assignments or direct employment. Retired professionals 55 and older may also apply through CSEP to participate in the RESERVE program through which candidates are matched with a specific short-term project Selected participants called reservists are assigned to a community work site to help fill critical gaps such as support for social workers, strategic planning, foundation outreach, event planning, and information technology administration. Currently, the city has 251 reservists. In addition to receiving ongoing assistance such as job retention and career advancement support, all of our CSEP participants, including both Title Fives and reservists, undergo comprehensive trainings which include thorough discussions and identifying ageism and how to get support if faced with age-based discrimination. We also work closely with participating employers which are carefully screened and selected and identified as age-friendly. We also encourage these employers to hire our participants directly underscoring the incredible value and benefits older workers bring to their organization, including a strong work ethic, reliability, and punctuality, which are common attributes of older workers. The City of New York is itself a participating employer. The New York City Department of Education, Human Resources Administration, Department of Parks and Recreation, and a dozen other city agencies partner with us as CSEP work sites and place many of our participants. Additionally, New York City's Workforce One career centers, operated by the Department of Small Business Services, offer workshops and preparation courses on a variety of topics to job seekers. Located throughout the five boroughs, these centers provide access to career advisement, skills and job training, and other tools that support a comprehensive job search. Formalized through a memorandum of understanding, DIFTA and SBS are close partners and actively utilize each other's resources and expertise. Older adults who visit a Workforce One center and meet the Title V eligibility requirements, for example, are referred to CSEP. Conversely, CSEP applicants who do not meet income eligibility requirements are referred to Workforce One for assistance. DIFTA also regularly participates in Workforce One partner meetings and employer recruitments. Although affecting change around ageism is a considerable undertaking, 
DIFTA remains committed to tackling it on all fronts. We are grateful to the Council for championing this important issue and thank you again for this opportunity to provide testimony. We're pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Good afternoon, Chair Chin um, and members of the Committees on Aging and Civil and Human Rights. I'm Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. And I'm here, I am pleased to be here today on behalf of Commissioner Carmelin P. Malales, along with my colleague from the Department of Aging, Deputy Commissioner Karen Resnick, to discuss the work of the Commission in combating age discrimination in the workplace. Because the Commission has not had the opportunity to appear before the Committee on Aging previously, I'll briefly describe the work of our agency. By statute, the Commission has two main functions. The first is a civil law enforcement agency enforcing the city's anti-discrimination law called the New York City Human Rights Law, one of the most comprehensive anti-discrimination laws in the country. The Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau investigates complaints of discrimination from the public, initiates its own investigations on behalf of the city, and utilizes its in-house testing program to help identify an entities breaking the law. The law includes 24 areas of protection, most of which protect against discrimination and harassment in practically all areas of city living, employment, housing, public accommodations, on the streets, in transit, and in other spaces. Allegations of discrimination come to the Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau for investigation in several ways. Members of the public may file a complaint with the Law Enforcement Bureau about their own experience. A lawyer may file a complaint on a person's behalf. Service providers, community-based organizations, members of faith communities, elected officials, or any other individual may bring specific incidents or potential patterns of discrimination to the Law Enforcement Bureau's attention, and the Law Enforcement Bureau can initiate its own investigation. The Commission can obtain monetary damages for the complainant and require that the wrongdoer change policy, undergo training, complete community service, among many other forms of affirmative relief, and pay civil penalties to the general fund of the City of New York. The second main function of the Commission is to perform community outreach and provide education on the City Human Rights Law and human rights related issues, which is why the Commission also has community <coughs> service centers in each of the, five, the City's five boroughs. The Community Relations Bureau provides free workshops on individuals' rights and businesses, employers, and housing providers' obligations under the City Human Rights Law creates engaging programming on human rights and civil rights related issues, from youth-centered conversations on LGBTQ rights to forums on disability access, and builds spaces for communities to engage in dialogue and foster connection, such as, for example, earlier this year, we held an Immigrant Justice Interfaith Seder, and actually tomorrow, this month, we'll be hosting a networking event focusing on building coalition within the African immigrant, African American, Afro-Caribbean, and Afro-Latinx communities and other uh, self-identified black communities. The Office of the Chairperson focuses on policy legislation, rulemaking, legal enforcement guidance, and serves as the adjudicatory body for the Commission, hearing appeals from closed law enforcement bureau matters, and issuing final decisions and orders on cases that have been litigated through the oath process. In addition, the Office of the Chairperson oversees major Commission projects, including a recent report on xenophobia, Islamophobia, and anti-Semitism experienced by Muslim, Arab, South Asian, Jewish, and Sikh New Yorkers, up to and following the 2016 presidential election released this year, based on a survey the Commission conducted of, of over 3,100 New Yorkers. And a few weeks after the Me Too movement was reignited last fall, the Commission convened a public hearing on sexual harassment in the workplace, which resulted in a report released earlier this year, coinciding with the, pa with the passage and implementation of a legislative package strengthening protections against gender-based harassment in the workplace. The City Human Rights Law protects against discrimination based on age in employment, housing, and public accommodations. Unlike the Federal Age Discrimination and Employment Act, there is no threshold age one must be in order to be protected under the City Human Rights Law. Over the past two years, the Commission has filed 112 complaints on behalf of individuals alleging age discrimination. The vast majority of those cases are in the employment context. And since 2015, the Commission has filed nearly 700 cases on behalf of New Yorkers 55 years and older, alleging discrimination across many protected categories, including disability, religion, race, caregiver status, and others. Cases alleging workplace discrimination on the basis of age or disability, or both, have increased. Age discrimination in the workplace is insidious and can manifest in both implicit bias and overt conduct. Several examples from cases recently resolved at the Commission 
demonstrate the work the agency is doing to combat age discrimination. In one case, an employee stated that he had been subjected to repeated discriminatory comments related to his age by his supervisor and reported the comments internally, but no action was taken. The Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau investigate, investigated and negotiated a resolution resulting in a conciliation agreement between the employer, the employee, the Commission, and the supervisors responsible. The agreement required the employer to pay $25,000 in emotional distress damages and provide anti-discrimination training to supervisors and managers in the employee's unit, as well as retraining um, the supervisor involved in the case, who is no longer employed, oh sorry, as, excuse me, as well as retraining to certain managers on reporting and remediating complaints of discrimination. In addition, the supervisor involved in the case, who is no longer employed by the supervisor, by the employer, was required to undergo 20 hours of community service with seniors. In another matter, an older female employee reported that she was labeled not a team player for engaging in behavior that was not sim similarly characterized when displayed by younger male colleagues. And as a result, she lost her job. After an investigation, the Law Enforcement Bureau issued a de determination of probable cause. The commission, the complainant, and the respondent ultimately entered into a conciliation agreement requiring the respondent to pay the complainant $27,500 in damages. The agreement also involves monitoring of the respondent involved in the case. The employer is required to provide information to the commission if any other discrimination-related complaint is filed against that individual respondent for a period of three years. In addition, the respondent's human resources staff will be trained on, on the anti-discrimination law. The Commission's Community Relations Bureau regularly partners with community-based organizations like the Senior Umbrella Network, SAGE, the Queensboro Council for Social Welfare, and others to provide Know Your Rights information on age discrimination and protections under the city human rights law. The Commission has presented Know Your Rights information sessions at dozens of senior centers over the past several years, bringing awareness of protections against age discrimination to over 1,000 seniors across the five boroughs. Our relationships with the Queensboro Council for Social Welfare and SAGE are longstanding. We meet regularly at those organizations to ensure that our team is able to address specific issues related not only to age discrimination, but other forms of discrimination, including LGBTQ discrimination, disability discrimination, and discrimination in housing for a whole host of protected categories. Most recently, on May 30th, 2018, the Commission, along with our colleagues at DIFTA, presented at the Ageism Symposium, sponsored at the Brooklyn Public Library's Older Adult Services Unit. And on September 20th, Commission staff will be speaking on the city human rights law at another aging symposium sponsored by the Senior Umbrella Network of Brooklyn and will highlight protections against age-based discrimination as well as discrimination housing, issues around accessibility, and other areas that intersect with age-based discrimination. If any council member is interested in having our team work with your staff to develop an outreach event, on-site legal clinic, or any other programming for your constituents, we would be more than happy to collaborate with you. We thank you for, your con for convening this hearing today and we look forward to your questions. Thank you. I'm gonna start off with a, a few questions and then I invite my colleagues uh, if they have questions. Um, for DIFTA, because um, you have the, uh, the work, uh, I mean the job training programs and all these programs for senior employment, has, has DIFTA seen or heard of any uh, instance of seniors uh, uh, alleging age discrimination in employment? Um, really only anecdotally, there's, there's no data that we can actually report on, but yes, we have heard people coming into the program looking for employment, saying that as an older worker they find it difficult to either get or retain employment. Um, so what do you refer them to? Do you um, help them with the situation or try to um, maybe refer them to over to the We of city course Human refer Rights. to our city partners. We do education for everybody that comes into the program about knowing their rights and how they can make a claim if they feel that they've been discriminated against. And then we also work with employers to encourage them to hire older workers. So are there any like best practices or guidance that you recommend to ensure that employers are being age friendly? There's been work done through actually the Age Friendly Commission. Um, and Ruth Finkelstein, when she was at Columbia, was working with 
um, giving awards actually to age-friendly employers. So there is encouragement around best practices in working with and hiring older workers. So what about, I guess, DIFTA as a, a city agency? Um, do you uh, use these kind of practices in hiring and retaining uh, employees? Does DIFTA have uh, employees from a diverse age group? And what percentage of your workers are age uh, 55 and older? I didn't bring that data with us. I can certainly um, get that from our human resources, but we actually have a very large percentage of workers that are over 55, including me. <laughs> That's good. I think uh, we would love to uh, see the data, the data. I mean, it would be great for DIFTA to provide we do lead leadership. By example. So that I, I don't know how we do compared to other agencies, but I, our average employment age is quite advanced. Well, I think we need to also look at other agencies. I mean, the city should take the lead uh, on really being age-friendly and, and giving opportunity uh, to older adults to continue to share their skills and, uh, with the city. Absolutely. What about the, uh, in the city, um, the Commission on Human Rights? Do you also provide best practices in terms of having a diverse uh, age group in your employees? Um, we have not issued best practices on this specific area of protection, um, but we have best practices and uh, legal enforcement guidance in, in other areas, one being uh, disability discrimination, which may sometimes overlap um, with with age discrimination cases. Um, we also have issued um, information around caregiver discrimination, which um, affects the whole population in one way or another, but those are new protection, that's a new protection in our law passed a couple years ago to prohibit discrimination due to someone's caregiving responsibilities, whether it be a spouse, a child, or a parent. So I guess in terms of like throughout the city agencies there, do you share or like these best practices for having, you know, older adults uh, in the workforce in the city agency, um, and making sure that the different agencies are, you know, doing the right thing and providing opportunities for these uh, older workers. We are regularly um, speaking with our sister agencies on an intergovernmental level to talk about um, new protections in the law, the existing protections um, and requirements. Um, under the city human rights law. Um, we also work with DCAS pretty regularly to ensure that you know, trainings are up to date, information is getting out to um, all the, our sister agencies as employers themselves. We have enforcement authority over our sister agencies. So as an employer, as a provider of public accommodation or as a housing provider in some circumstances perhaps, we um, have enforcement authority over our sister agencies as well. So we are regularly from from the non-enforcement perspective, trying to get information out to our um, to the city agencies so that they understand their obligations under the law and can um, ensure that they're following best practices. In your testimony, the the number of complaints that the uh, the commission receive is very low. A hundred, you only filed like a hundred and twelve complaint in the last two years. Why do you think the complaints are so low? Yeah, you know, as we were preparing for this hearing, we were, we were I was talking a lot with our law enforcement team, and I think one of the challenges in these cases, um, I think is, this, is a sense that this is happening at the hiring stage, that employers are either turning away or not taking seriously or have sort of an implicit bias against old, hiring older adults, and those cases, I think, are very challenging, um, both to recognize that it's happening, but also to bring to the commission and for the commission to investigate. Those are some of the most, and under any category, a failure to hire case is one of the most challenging cases to prove because the person who's feeling the discrimination is has an absence of information. They don't know who the other candidates are. They don't know if this is a pattern or practice. Um, they don't know if it's some other reason or they just have a sense that it might be their age or, or their membership in another protected group. 
Um, so it's a challenge. Uh, those cases are particularly challenging. And um, what we encourage is if we, if we hear or if you hear from your constituents um, or any community-based organization that there are employers out there that are routinely turning away qualified candidates, we, sh we want to know about it. And you don't e individuals don't even need to put um, their name on a complaint for us to do an investigation. We can request documents. We can um, talk to um, the HR department. We can do our own investigation without an individual putting their name on a complaint. Um, but I think that that's one of the challenges that we face in dealing with, with these types of cases, particularly in the hiring context. Yeah, one of the things that we were looking at is that that during the hiring pro process, if uh, the employee um, do not look at the year that you graduated from college or high school, they can't tell your age, and they're not supposed to ask your age, right? Is it against the law to ask your age when, when you're looking for a job? It's not explicitly prohibited to ask one's age, but I would say that it is problematic um, to ask one's age um, because it raises the specter that a why is this valid and b um, you know that they're going to consider that in their hiring practices um, so the question you know oftentimes forms will have you fill out your date of birth um, and whether that's relevant or not is probably questionable for a lot of those forms um, we wouldn't say asking that information is per se unlawful but that it is certainly problematic yeah so and that's not why recommended. We should look at legislatively if there's something that we can do. Like you can ask for your birthday, but not the year, <laughs> right? Uh, so we have to figure out a way uh, because that is preventing a lot of older workers who have the skill and the experience um, to do a great job, but they get stopped at the door. Um, and also I think that there are other, um, what I've heard, like there are other methods of advertising, like on Facebook or whatever, that they do, you know, specify certain types of age, or and then that's something that we really need to also look at that the discriminatory practice in advertising for these jobs. Um, Councilmember Malone, you have a question, and also we've been joined by Councilmember Deutsch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Always a pleasure to be your partner with our seniors. Uh, thank you to the deputy commissioners. This is one of those hearings where we're all on the same page trying to find out more and what we can do as always to protect our seniors. So it's a pleasure to meet you, Susan and, and Karen and the together here. Uh, lots of good stuff jump out from this and having these type of discussions is so critical for us to understand where the base is and how we can raise the bar a little bit. Is there any existing law or requirement or regulation mandating employers to file the age of their employees at their company, the diversity from what age they have. We have every other requirement from who they're hiring. Is there any requirement out there to file how many seniors are with a particular company or just age? Not that I'm aware of, no. I think that might start raising the bar of the conversation that if it's exposed that a large, maybe we start with larger companies in New York City or larger businesses of, of a certain level, that now we have to know the amount, the age of each employee. If it's gonna be quickly show that they have zero or five out of a million or 10 or 100, whatever they may have, um, we may start seeing some hiring differences along the line saying, hey, we gotta fill this gap because now we have to show that we have zero people above 62. Or 50. I find myself at 51 as one of the oldest council members, so age is changing as, as, as we get older. Um, would that be a good idea? Would that be something? Has another jury county anywhere else done that that you could think of? You know, I'm unaware of that, but I do know there, there have been proposed similar reporting requirements around gender or race, um, right. you know, with respect to pay disparity <laughs> and other things, so, um, but I'm unaware of, of one. Well, so, so Dana, then maybe we could. I guess so it's good to hear from you and, and what's going on there. So who is part of, how many employees do you have in the law enforcement section of your commission? Um, we are at a total headcount currently at 142. And um, our breakdown, oh, thank you. Our, we have 79 staff in our law enforcement bureau right now. And that is, um, includes administrative staff, attorneys, um, leadership, and our testers for our testing program and things like that. 
Is any part of that staff dedicated to senior com complaints or concerns? Or that is it is just a general? Most of our staff um, have a general sort of docket. We have supervisors that focus on certain areas of, of expertise, um, but, we, but most of our attorneys handle a generalized docket. Do you find that some place that maybe we could have a specialized area just focusing on senior concerns and age discrimination? I think it's something Maybe next year's budget fight. We We're always looking to advocate for more money into DIFTA and for the agencies for the seniors. This might be an area where we have a targeted task force. I, I think we would welcome that conversation and think about ways that we can be strategic around enforcement. So you, you said there was 112 complaints filed, but is that the same as somebody actually making a call or concern? Do we have the data on how many people actually called and said, hey, my employer, and then maybe you never filed a complaint? Mm -hmm. I don't have that. That's a very good point. I don't have the information around what we call pre-complaint interventions, which is a, a great deal of what we do um, in an effort to move things along, particularly where people are currently in the workplace and are feeling like they are perhaps being retaliated against or they're being subjected to discriminatory treatment. Um, we have um, a system now in place to fast track that, have a commission staff member, whether it be one of the attorneys or an investigator, um, sort of engage immediately without filing a complaint. Yeah, that would be critical information because if that number is also on the rise, it's a larger number than 112, clearly. So if we have um, 500 calls and only 112 result in complaints, but that 500 next year becomes 600 and then 800, more and more people, and it may also go to the outreach between you and DIFTA as to how to get the information out to make the complaint. You know, with our seniors, it's a lot of landlocked information. If we don't get to the senior center, if we don't get to them, they may never know how to file that. So we may have to do some more homework on how to expand that. Right. Who makes the determination whether a call that's made actually becomes a complaint? Oftentimes, it'll, it's the complainant themselves, the individual calling. So they, it's really, um, in many circumstances, it's self-directed. They, 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 that individual will decide what route they want to take. And sometimes, again, if you're currently in the workplace, escalating something is challenging. There's a whole host of reasons why someone might not want to file a formal complaint. Um, and we recognize that. And so we um, provide options to people, whether we can, um, like I said, you don't need an individual to come forward for us to get involved. We can do something called a commission-initiated investigation, which avoids having an individual's name on the complaint, but particularly if we're hearing about a pattern um, or um, a particularly troubling situation, we can um, do our own investigation by requesting um, documents, by interviewing witnesses, um, gathering our own um, our own information. And so what if a situation doesn't, you're able to help them, mm -hmm. and they, f they find an alternate resolution? But is that information kept? What if that employer now has 10, 15, 20 calls, and you've managed to deal with them, but they don't ever raise to the level of a complaint? Do we know those employers now? as to maybe starting to have a bad track record? Yes, we track um, patterns so that um, we ultimately, so the commission represents the city in these cases, and if as a city agency we decide that it's in the city's best interest to not resolve these in sort of one-off phone calls, but we're starting to see a pattern emerge, that's particularly where the commission initiated um, power of the agency is most we think effective. So um, again, if we're, if we're getting two, three, four calls about the same employer, but no one decides to put their name in a complaint, we track that information and that's when we will engage in a deeper investigation to make sure that this isn't a broader problem. And when we do- um, Is there any other coordinating agencies when that happens or is it just you? It's just us. That's just under our, our power, yeah. That might be something we want to look at also. So what would happen then um, are you finding that most of the people that are making the calls and or complaints are doing it individually or are they represented by a lawyer? Most folks are calling um, on their own behalf. Um, we recently, there was an amendment to the city human rights law that allows attorneys to collect attorney's fees at the commission through the commission process. Um, paid, you know, it, it would be resolved as part of uh, any sort of larger resolution um, for the fees to be paid um, to the complainant's attorney. So we have more and more attorney filed complaints on behalf of individuals. Do you think if we were to provide a lawyer for seniors for this type of service that complaints might raise? We are providing lawyers for just about everyone, but I'm always fighting to get seniors more legal representation. So maybe if they knew the standards, and, and the process itself is sometimes difficult, maybe a, a lawyer could help. Like at, at your stage, when somebody gets the call, you might be able to say, you know, there are legal services available 
for you to guide you through, even though where the city a commission or the agency is mm -hmm. dealing with it, maybe a, that might not be a, another way that we can get these complaints properly administered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the standard that someone has to meet? So if I, if I thought Haim was busting my chops and he didn't want to hire me because I'm 51 and much, much older than him, even though he's a grandfather, um, do I have to, you said probable cause. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty high standard. That's our criminal standard. I have one of the lawyers left on the, on the council. So you actually have to, that's beyond, almost getting to the beyond a reasonable date probable cause. Is there any circumstantial evidence level that was ever considered or can we lower that standard? Sure, so um, probable cause in our context is actually a lower standard because we are civil law enforcement. So while it's the same phrase, it actually means something different and it's really a sort of a, a over 50%, discrimination is more likely to have occurred than not occurred. And it's um, not quite as high as in the criminal context, again, because we are a civil law enforcement agency. So um, if, if someone comes in the door and says, I believe I did not get this job because of my age, and they can make a generalized sort of observation, that we can file that complaint. And it's, on, it's our job as the attorneys and investigators for the city to pull together the necessary information to reach that 50% plus mark, that it was more likely than not that discrimination occurred. And most of our cases will resolve sometime between complaint being filed and probable cause being issued. Because like any other sort of litigation posture, cases resolve through conciliation, which is a sort of a settlement that involves essentially three parties, the commission as the city, the complainant, and the respondent. Um, our cases will close because um, the parties settle privately and the commission decides that it's in the, it's, it's in the city's best interest to allow that settlement to happen and the, com the commission will essentially allow that. But you have some settlements that happen before the complainant also because you got involved. Right. So I think, uh, and Madam Chair, I think that's what's so great about today's hearing. There's, there's so much more for follow-up and ideas here because there's different levels. It, the 112 is not the right number. So, and I think we need to to elaborate on the fact that age discrimination is happening at a greater level and we have to be able to deal with it. So lots of different ways to deal with it is A, giving you the resources to deal with it and then B, able to identify and then deal with it in different situations because as a demographic, seniors have a difficulty getting to that information. Um, we have this conversation with Karen and, and Difter on almost any resource that we provide for the seniors. So age discrimination may not be something that people talk about, they may feel guilty for not getting the job, they're not going to say, hey, listen, you know, I gave it my best shot, but if, if we can guide them through, and I think if we make a requirement for employers to actually list the age of their employees, especially for the larger employers in the city, you're going to start raising the bar of awareness to seniors that, hey, you should have seniors in your company, and why don't you? It's almost the moral guilt at this point that's guiding just about everything else is why don't you have any seniors? What, what, what is your company's excuse? So unless we get to that level of data, then you'll be able to hire the correct staff and maybe have a dedicated team to deal with age discrimination in your group, and then we can maybe get some additional information. So if you can bring back to, to Chair Chin, um, the, those that didn't reach the level of complaints, the amount of calls that you're getting, and then maybe we think about a piece of legislation where we're requiring employers of a certain size to list the age of the employees. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. Uh, we have questions from Council Member Deutsch. Thank you, Chair. So first of all, I'm not a senior, but I am a grandfather. I have two grandkids, ages three and five, so my wife doesn't let me go and hang out with the senior, with the women out there. So, um, so whenever I go to my senior centers, I say, keep this a secret, don't tell my wife, but I'll be back. Um, but I just want to say that um, as, as a city, um, you know, we're talking about going after um, companies, uh, discrimination, but as a city, we need to set a good example to everyone. And I know the city has job fairs all the time in all five boroughs. So I want to know, first of all, how many complaints do you receive against city agencies uh, for not uh, discriminating against seniors, number one? And number two is that um, when the city has job fairs, they have almost every single agency at those, at, at those job fairs. How many seniors actually get hired? I'd like to know an answer to that. Um, 
so, I mean, we, maybe we need to do, we always have health fairs for seniors. Uh, maybe we should have job fairs. You know, people have a difficult time making ends meet. And uh, any seniors here looking for a job? <laughs> I notice plenty, you see that? Plenty of seniors looking for a job. And we need to give them the opportunity and hold the city accountable and set a good example for everyone else because enforcement is easy. But we need to look at ourselves first. And then we could set an example and say, look, the city is doing our part. Now you have to do your part. So uh, first, I'd like to know if you have an answer to those two questions. Um, unfortun unfortunately, Council Member Deutsch, I um, do not have information about claims against city agencies for discrimination based on age, but I can gather that information and get it to you. Um, as far as job fairs, I, I don't have information about how many seniors obtain employment through job fairs, but I think um, a job fair specifically focusing on seniors sounds like a very compelling project. Um, you know, we've been involved in job fairs related to people with criminal histories when the criminal history protections came out. Um, so I think that that's something that we would be happy to partner on. Great. I look forward to be at your first uh, senior job fair. I'll be the first one there. So remember that. We're going to have a senior job fair. We're going to hold everyone accountable here. Thank you very much. So at the Department for the Aging, through our Title V Senior Employment Program, we do host job fairs and attend job fairs quite regularly. Um, and we work with about 300 employers where we try to place older workers. And I don't have the placement numbers with me today, but I can certainly get you the numbers about how successful we are placing right. older workers. Numbers don't matter, let's get results. Okay. Let's do that. Let's, let's have, have, a, let's have some seniors job fairs and let's get the seniors uh, the jobs that, that they deserve. Everyone agree? Thank you, Council Member Doyle. We're not supposed to rouse up the crowd, okay? Gotta go. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. We have uh, questions from Council Member Ayala. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this question is for Deputy Commissioner Sussman. Is there like a, is there, is, are the discrimination complaints coming from a specific industry? You know, I asked our law enforcement team if they could provide me with trends around age discrimination claims, and they could not identify specific trends around industry, but what the more common complaints that we're seeing are um, sort of like the, one, the, the ones that I described in the testimony around derogatory comments, people being forced out at a certain, or feeling like they're being forced out at a certain age or forced to retire when they're not ready. I think Council Member Chin had mentioned that as well, um, but I don't have trends on specific industries. Is that because there's no way of tracking it? Um, no, we can, we can look at each complaint mm -hmm. and see if we can assess if there are trends or if they're concentrated in particular industries and get that information to you. Yeah, I'd be interested in seeing that data. Um, Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner Resnick, how are you? So Title V I know really well because a lot, when I worked in senior services, a lot of my seniors um, actually were participants of the program. Can you tell us how many slots currently exist in New York City for Title V? I'm trying to see if I have that. I know what our funding level is at the department through our two grants, but I don't know if I have the data about how many slots. And it, by the way, it is not only uh, the, the New York City Department for the Aging gets a state office for the aging grant, um, as well as a National Council on Aging grant. And there are other such grants in the city of New York, so we're not the only provider of Title V. Um, but I can get you at least the number of how many slots we have. Yeah, I think because I, I, I'm just trying to figure out, so we have a, there's a four year uh, term is that because we don't have enough slots or you know enough positions that's available? That's mandated by the Department that's of Labor mandated. who oversees the program. That's the is guidelines there, of the program. Is there an opportunity for an extension? Um, there may be an opportunity for waivers that I believe we've gotten for individuals. Okay. But yes, you're right that if somebody stays on, it doesn't open up slots for new people, although we get a new allocation. I mean, I think year. my concern is, right, um, that 
as we as rents continue to, to skyrocket in New York City, older adults are being forced to not only work until you know the later years, but also to subsidize the how the, the the income that they are bringing in, right? And so I see this a lot, even as the director of constituent services for the prior council member. Um, some of my seniors are trying to get jobs at the local supermarket just to mm -hmm. be able to supplement the rent. Um, so my concern is if you know if you have a, a senior that's already employed through the Title V program and is receiving a subsidy because it's not a lot of money, but it's still enough to make ends meet, um, if there's an opportunity to extend that, um, because circumstances are not likely to change in four years. So that's obviously something that you know I would be I would advocate for, and I wonder you know depending on the number of slots, is it because we don't have enough slots to go around that we have this four-year life cycle? Um, and if there's any way that the council could advocate, right, on a federal and state level for more slots? I'm not sure. We would welcome that, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Can you just remind us again, what's the percentage of uh, seniors that participate in Title V, actually get a permanent job? Yeah, I d I'm sorry that I don't have the placement numbers with me, but um, we do a good job at placing older workers. Yeah, I mean, definitely it would be good to get um, that statistic. We also have been joined by Council Member Rose on uh, the Committee of Aging and Council Member Kalos on Civil Rights. Uh, Council Member Deutsch has a follow-up question. Yes, um, yeah, I just have a question. Um, so the NYPD, there's an age limit that at 63, that's it, you're done. You're forced to retire. Uh, the FDNY, the age limit is 65. At 65, you're also forced to retire. So I have a resolution that I'm drafting to the state to at least a, uh, raise the age limit for the NYPD to be as the same as the FDNY. So how is it that when you're a city agency, you're forced to retire at a certain age? Is that considered discrimination? So there's um, certain laws essentially supersede um, the age discrimination protections in our law. And by statute, those retirement age are statutory. Um, and unfortunately, there's we would not, it's essentially a conflict of laws issue and the, and the mandatory retirement age um, exempts coverage under the city human rights law. So could I file a complaint today against the FDNY and NYPD for discrimination? I don't. And let's go after the state? I don't believe so. I think there would have to be changes made to the statute in order for um, there to be a claim like that because there's a statutory mandate to. Um, but that's a bill in the state, right? I believe so I how, how do we so. allow the state to, to do that, to, to have an age limit? I mean, we're getting all the um, experienced offices <clears throat> forced to retire. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think we need experience. Uh, crime is going up. I just read this morning, murders are going up, rapes are going up across the city. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to keep experience. And if we're talking about discrimination on age limit, maybe we should do something collaboratively with the council and uh, with your agency to go after the state and saying, listen, you cannot force someone out at a certain age. I, I would have to defer to the experts in, at my sister agencies um, at, at PD and fire to, to speak to this issue specifically. I don't want to, I don't want to represent, you know, their. Or you're going to have to hire Hiam, one or the other. That's your other choice. All right. No, so I, I, I'd like to, I'd love to know, I'd like to have a follow up on this and to see what we can do because I don't understand how a bill could supersede something when it's age discrimination. That's clearly what it is to me mm -hmm. and to many people in the, in, in the FDNY and the NYPD that are being, pu being pushed out mm -hmm. at a certain age. So that's something we need, to, we need to look at. I know a traffic agent, if you're a traffic agent, you could be 120 years old and you could still be a traffic agent, <laughs> right? That's true. Um, but in certain agencies, you're basically being pushed out. Mm -hmm. I um, wanted to have a follow-up question about, um, in 2015, the council passed Local Law 33, uh, establishing an employment discrimination testing program. So has the commission done any testing on age discrimination? I, 
I don't have those numbers with me today, but I'm happy to get back to you on how many of our uh, testing cases have involved age. And I believe um, they are reported in our annual report for this year, so I can pull those and get that to you. Yeah, I mean, like that would like involve some of this, like looking at advertisements and whether it's in the paper, on online, to see if there's just like fair housing. Um, discriminations. Right, and testing specifically often involves having an individual, a member that represents that particular protected class, so whether it's age or race or using a voucher in housing, um, and then having someone that's not in that protected class sort mm -hmm. of apply or make the initial inquiry and then seeing if um, one is re essentially the identical applicants and one is rejected and we can yeah. sort of isolate the reason around that protected category. So that's specifically what testing often looks like. Um, it could be as simple as making a phone call and saying you're interested in a position um, and being of a one gender or another um, and identifying whether there's a positive test there. There's also the commission initiated work we do around advertisements um, where we still see no vouchers accepted or uh, n no felons or no criminal history and those are per se violations of the city human rights law. Um, so we do a, a couple, diff there's a couple different methods that we have around testing and around commission initiated um, cases with respect to advertising, um, but I can get the, the age specific numbers for you. Okay. Um, the other thing with, um, if someone filed a case uh, with the commission and it did not, you know, uh, get the result that the person won, uh, does the commission refer them to uh, other, other level of government to see if they can continue to pursue their case? Sure, so if um, a case is closed at our agency um, in, in several different legal postures, one can appeal that decision to state court. So there's always an, another option to take a second look at the case and uh, challenge essentially the commission's decision to close the case. Um, if the um, individual, for example, faced age discrimination but was not in New York City, um, was not applying for a job based in New York City or was not a worker in New York City, um, they can file with the State Division of Human Rights, which covers similar agency, different law, but covers people across uh, New York State, and they have offices in New York City and, in, and outside of New York City. So we um, can look at the case and see if it's jurisdictional for our agency, and if it's not, because either it might have happened outside of the five boroughs, or it happened beyond our statute of limitations, which is one year from the last discriminatory act. There may be other options, and our intake staff and our attorneys are well-versed on referrals to other agencies, to state court, if that's appropriate, or to our sister agencies, because it might not be a discrimination issue, but it might be um, a program question for DIFTA, for example, or another sister agency, and we regularly cross-refer. Do you, in your outreach, do you develop specific material that explain what age discrimination looks like so that seniors, you know, <clears throat> when they go to a job fair, they can actually pick up this kind of valuable information? Because uh, they might not know that. How do you describe age discrimination when you're looking for a job or, or in your job? Mm -hmm. um, we have our sort of communications and know your rights materials. Um, are on our website. I believe we do not currently have one specific on age, although we do have several that go through sort of discrimination more broadly in all the protected categories, including age and the resources at the commission, how to contact the commission. Um, but we'd welcome um, taking that on and we can talk further about what that might look like. That, that would be great, I think, to develop some specific flyer that kind of describe in the cases, what age discrimination would look like when you go apply for a job or, or in your job. So that people kind of know, oh yeah, this is happening to me. And maybe I should do something about it. Uh, so if you can, we can work with you to help develop that. And I'm sure the advocates would love to work with you on that too. Okay, we have a lot, <coughs> we have a lot of people sign up to testify. So um, we will follow up with questions. Yep. Oh. oh, you have a question? Uh, thank you to our uh, agent chair, Margaret Chen. I'm just going to follow up. So I, I see every day people reach out to my office for jobs. 
And uh, one of the things that I hear, including from some of the members in my audience, is just that when you are older, not, not even necessarily uh, a senior, but just as you get older in life, it gets harder and harder to find a new job. So we're hearing from people in their 50s that they just can't get a job. Uh, and so I guess beyond some of the enforcement you're talking about, uh, does, D, uh, does DIFTA have a list of employers that have taken, made an affirmative commitment to hire folks who are older New Yorkers and not hire people at minimum wage, but if you have somebody who is a six-figure earner uh, who is now on Social Security and just can't make it in my district and many of the other very expensive districts where the, your Social Security stays the same but the cost of living keeps going up, yep. uh, where those folks can get the same high-quality jobs that they once had. So our Title V program is actually income tested and really targeted to the lowest income older adults. And as I mentioned, we do work with um, over 300 employers who are age friendly and have been very welcoming of hiring older workers. Um, somebody who is in their 50s and unemployed and still needing to work even at higher incomes can go to any of the SBS Workforce One um, workforce development sites to help seek employment. With regards to the 300 employers that DFTA has existing relationships with, does DFTA circulate uh, job postings to a list of uh, older New Yorkers so that they can see that not only are there specific jobs, but they could possibly even subscribe to specific types of jobs at specific salary levels so that they know that these are folks who are inclined and that DFTA could also be included in the process to make sure that uh, if the employer has indicated they're willing to do something properly and follow the laws, that they're actually doing so. I don't believe that we circulate job postings outside of our employment program, but that's certainly something we, I can take back and discuss. Uh, my, my colleague, Councilmember Ayala, with whom I, I share uh, a, a border, and I'm happy to represent a very small portion of East Harlem, which she represents so much of, uh, mentioned that in your testimony you had mentioned doing job fairs. We were curious when the last job fair was and if you'd be interested in doing one uh, in our districts uh, on our border, as it were, to help some, a, a lot of my seniors in the audience, a lot of her seniors in the audience, and a lot of folks all over the uh, city. Um, I don't have the date of our last job fair, but I know that we have a job fair coming up in the next couple of weeks, actually. So I can get that information to your offices and, and people are welcome. Uh, yeah, yes, please. Uh, I was hoping you might have it off the top of your head so folks watching at home could uh, mark their calendars and get there. Not seeing anyone in the audience running up with the information. Uh, and then beyond that job fair, would you be open to partnering with uh, individual members or delegations to host these job fairs in all uh, five boroughs and do so annually? I don't know that I could commit because I don't know that we have the capacity to do that, but I do hear that it's something you would like us to consider. I'm, I'm, I'm just interested in every day constituents are reaching out. They can't afford to stay in this city. Even if they may have retired or they might be between jobs, they're having difficulty Here. attaining the income they need. We can either build more affordable housing, and that's the committee I chair, and we're going to do that, but we can also make sure we lift people out of poverty, especially folks who have fallen in. So I, I look forward to working with uh, the chair of uh, the aging committee as well as my, my colleagues in, in all five boroughs. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for <coughs> coming in to testify. Thank you very much. We're going to invite up the first panel. 
Francis Scanlon. And we have uh, <coughs> the group from the Radical Age Movement. Bobby Sackman, Steve uh, Bernhardt, Jamie Dizon, Alice Fisher, <coughs> Ashton Applewhite, Renee Rosenberg, and Kristen uh, Rose. Oh, we have, uh, we've been joined by Council Member Rodriguez. Yeah, I think so. Since we have a lot of people testifying, uh, if you have written testimony, please submit it. And we're going to have a time clock at three minutes. But uh, if you could summarize the key points, that would be very, very helpful. Thank you. Francis, you want to start? Wish everybody a happy Constitution Day and also Citizenship Day. Indeed, it was on a Monday in 1787 when the Constitution of the United States was ratified by the Constitutional Convention. So, age, it's written all over your face, mine too. Look in the mirror or others' faces as they behold yours. Age, it's written all over your face. It's in your face, mine too. It is undeniable, unequivocal, and upfront, exactly as it should be if you wish to live a long life well, extol, and revel in your age. That's the theory. Now the facts, the reality. Unless, of course, you are by chance past 40 and still believe that you have the capacity to make a meaningful contribution to society and to gainful employment commensurate with your skills. As earlier outlined, the New York City human rights law is a model in the United States. However, similar to the federal statute first enacted in 1967 that covers age discrimination specifically the ADAA, as well as the New York State human rights law, when it comes to age, the law is not all that it can be or that it should be. So right now, what I want to focus on is retaliation. We hear so much about discrimination. My hypothesis is that but for discrimination, there would be no retaliation. What role does retaliation, if any, play in connection with age discrimination? Retaliation is the one-two punch, consistent with all discrimination, most especially age discrimination. There can be no age discrimination without the implicit or explicit threat of retaliation. Retaliation 
weaponizes age discrimination, which many times is still as subtle as discrimination itself. That is why I asked the New York City Council to revisit the interrelationship between discrimination and retaliation, specifically the legal standard of proof required to demonstrate retaliation in seeking damages for age-related discrimination. Clear and unambiguous language that has been the hallmark of the New York City HRL that aims to preempt in the first instance and or redress the threat and or fact of retaliation will increase the likelihood of valid age discrimination lawsuits successfully withstanding judicial scrutiny. Re hashtag retaliate against age discrimination. The rights and responsibility of workers and the rights and responsibility of employers coexist on a continuum. Silence must not be the price aging workers pay to work through their golden years. Silence is never golden when it is a direct byproduct of retaliation. The standard of proof regarding the award of damages for retaliation in connection with blocking age discrimination claims must not be so draconian, it certainly currently is but for, to render it a standard of impossibility of fulfillment by employees. So the bottom line, I'd like both committees to commit today to revisit and to ask back both of the representatives of both of the agencies that testify today to look at why the paucity of claims, why they didn't proffer exact numbers, because clearly there are more than 127 people being discriminated against in the city of New York, I regret to say, at any age. So remember, ladies and gentlemen, the truth and the devil meet in the detail. But here, if the committee can commit to having its team of attorneys look specifically at why the standard for retaliation, to prove retaliation, is so high, employers, A, will continue to discriminate, B, it will serve as a deterrent for employees to step up, and C, once a valid claim is established, the employer will be held to treble damages so that you put real muscle in the law, and that, may I assure you, will command a lot more than 112 cases coming forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I'm uh, Bobby Sackman. I'm on the steering committee of Radical Age Movement, formerly director of public policy of Live On New York. I love people that are angry about this. And I want to applaud the committees for holding the first ever hearing on age discrimination in the workplace and your leadership, Councilwoman Chin. Radical Age Movement exists to confront ageism in, in all its forms. So I, you, you threw out a lot of good data. I'm just really gonna go to some ideas. We, we do have a public policy agenda that's attached to my testimony there. Um, and I think that we have, New York City has an opportunity to lead the nation because the situation stinks all over the nation for older workers. So I think we have a place to, uh, an opportunity to do some good work here. Um, I do want to mention Victoria Lipnick, who is the acting chair of the Federal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission, Equal Opportunity, has said that age discrimination is an open secret like sexual harassment was until recently. And I think if we start taking age discrimination in the workplace and in any form as seriously as we take sexual harassment, which is on everybody's mind, especially today, and obviously racial discrimination, homophobia, et cetera, that that will be a giant step forward. Right now, if you say so to somebody you're ageist or that's an ageist statement, they look at you very confused and they don't take it seriously. The Manpower Group, which tracks US talent, uh, US talent shortage, says that 46% of employers in this country cannot find workers. Well, where are they looking? 
we have older adults ready to work with experience and skills that are either getting pushed out of the, their jobs or they can't get into the job market. We also have terminology. As we know, language is very important in any form of discrimination to change the language. And we have something called digital natives and digital immigrants. If you're born after 1985, which makes you only 33 now, you are an immigrant. Now, just think of the multiple levels of uh, insult that that ha carries with it. So our policy agenda, it, some of this has been touched on, raising public awareness, uh, a no, a developing a Know Your Rights public transit campaign. There, there's been something on the trains I saw a few months ago uh, targeting pregnant women, which was a very good campaign. So likewise, why not target older workers on, on uh, buses and, and trains? And with all due respect, reaching a 1,000 people in senior centers is not exactly a public awareness campaign. As we all know, we could do that in a month. So uh, obviously, it has to be multilingual. So we need to do a better job, not only in senior centers, but to reach other older New Yorkers uh, beyond that. To uh, develop, what leverage does the city have? The city has a pension fund. How do they, how do they um, invest it? There are job and training programs. There are city contracts. There's RFPs. Is there any language in those contracts against age discrimination? Is there, we don't have a study. We don't even know the full scope of this program. We don't have the data. We need to know the consequences. Mayor uh, de Blasio has a New York Works program. Does that include people over the age of 50? I really wonder about that. So how do we develop an older job training uh, opportunity program, which Councilwoman Chin, you have mentioned. Um, and I, I, I'm thinking of it, Older Workers Employment Services. It spells out O's, O-W-E-S. But seriously, to have a job core program would be excellent. And then working with the media to change language, to change the framework. We're not just cutting old heads, as, as a ProPublica story said it. We are people with talent and skills, and, and we studies show we are more engaged. We are very productive, and that we pass information along intergenerationally, and that's really important. So I hope that in addition to looking at the legal side, we could take practical steps because people are looking for jobs now. And just finally, while the idea of a job fair is a good one, I would suggest that some of them be intergenerational because the same companies are gonna keep showing up if it's only for older workers. I think you get a bigger spread if you try to make it, a, you know, spread out the age a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you. I would like to follow up on that, and actually I was going to be talking about intergenerational communication. Can you identify yourself? Yes, I am record? Renee Rosenberg, and I have been a career transition, clinical career certified counselor for over 35 years, working in the field with people over 50, 60, and 70. I've aged with them. So my clients have, I, I've seen the differences in, in our attitudes and our belief systems as I've grown older and as they've aged. And I'm listening, thank you for this, this committee, because I think this is extremely important, but I'm listening to some of the, the information that's been given, and I have a real strong aversion to job fairs, and I felt I needed to say something about that. I have never had a client get a job through a job fair. They're wonderful opportunities for research and finding out who the companies are, and yes, they need to be intergenerational. I think that's a very good point. And ageism does exist in the workforce, absolutely. We, we know that, and it is an issue, but it's also a stereotype. And so many of my clients have fallen victim to believing this as a stereotype, and I think that that's one of the big major problems that people have when they're interviewing for jobs as an older worker. They're fearful they're not gonna be hired because of their age, and they make that the issue. And I'd like to put on record that I believe very strongly that age is not the issue for so many people. They make it the issue. It's that they don't maybe have the skills, they don't have the, um, the attitude, it's an attitude that people need. I'm gonna tell you a very quick story, I know I have a few minutes, of a client of mine who was 62 who lost her job, was extremely angry, she'd been there for 20 years and wanted to work for another three or four years and she felt she was let go because of her age. She decided that she would go back and get more education 
ongoing education is what people are looking for now. So if you're an older worker and you're not retraining yourself and learning new skills, then you need to start to do that. And she did that. And she started to get, she put a, her profile on LinkedIn, which everyone needs to do nowadays. And if you're an older worker and you don't do that, then you're going to be discriminated against because you're not keeping up. So it's really an issue of keeping up. It's an issue of understanding what you need to do. She actually was encouraged to go back to her company because she only wanted to work part-time now. She went back and suggested that she can go part-time. They were delighted to have her back. The issue was not about her age, she found out. And after months of being totally angry and feeling it was a discrimination issue, which it wasn't. So we need to look very carefully at what we call ageism and discrimination and really look at it and see, is it about education? Is it about an attitude? Is it about a way of preparing oneself for looking for a job search? Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Ashton Applewhite, an activist against ageism. I'm 66 and not planning to head for the shuffleboard court anytime soon. I'm smack in the middle of baby boom and I have a lot of company. Older people who are challenging traditional norms and expanding the idea of retirement, whatever that word means now anyway. Other trends are also in play, groundswells like automation and artificial intelligence shifting the 21st century of what a job used to be towards nomadic and freelance work. Information-enabled activities don't require day-long mental or physical exertion, so they are a great fit for the supposedly diminished capacities of older people. Uh, older people want to keep working for lots of reasons. Work is a vital source of connection, social connection and identity, especially for men, a source of purpose and meaning. And of course, olders don't just want to work, they need to work. The combination of longer lives, the economic downturn of 2008, and the demise of traditional pensions mean that many people, millions and millions of Americans, have too little in retirement savings to support themselves comfortably. To survive, they either have to keep earning or, or learn to live on a lot less. Have you heard about the older nomads, not quite homeless, who drive from one low-wage job to another in second-hand RVs? According to the last census, older Americans were the only demographic for whom poverty rates increased. The situation is significantly worse for women who are even less likely to have enough money because we earn less and live longer and have less um, lower social security. We represent the only natural resource that is actually increasing, the social capital of millions more healthy, well-educated adults. What's the obstacle? Ageism, treating someone differently on the basis of how old we think they are. Discouraged and diminished, many older workers stop looking for work entirely, and many become economically dependent, contributing to the misperception that olders are a net burden to society, <clears throat> but it is not by choice, and it makes no sense, obviously, because if we are forced out of the job market, who is going to support us? Not one negative stereotype about older workers holds up, that we are less productive, less dependable, less committed, less teachable, to name only a few. Diversity became a buzzword because society grew less tolerant of racism and sexism and homophobia. If we don't think access to opportunity should depend on what someone looks like, gray hair and wrinkles count. It is blindingly obvious that age belongs alongside race, gender, ability, and sexual orientation as a criterion for diversity. Achieving age diversity is going to take nothing, nothing less than a mass movement like the ones that woke us up to entrench systems of racism and sexism around us. It means, and, and it means speaking up against age, ageism anywhere we encounter it, if everyone around the table is the same age for the same reason, unless there's a legit, legitimate reason. Confronting ageism means making the world a better place to live in, not just for people on the wrong side of some imaginary old young divide, but for everyone because longevity is here to stay. The changes we make in an age-neutral workforce will, of course, benefit the generations that follow us who feel the bite of ageism as young as their 40s, even 30s, which is when the ADEA kicks in. So I ask the New York City Commission to give this call for action legal and political teeth and to set a model for municipalities everywhere around the country. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Alice Fisher. I'm 72 years old, and I am the founder and executive director of the Radical Age Movement. 
Our mission is to confront ageism in our society and examine its impact on older adults. Over these years, we have looked at the many ways age prejudice is encountered today. The issue of most concern to our members and followers is financial security. The fear is that they will run out of money before they run out of life. For the past year, we have concentrated our efforts on ageism in the workforce. We want to thank Council Members Chin and Eugene for holding this hearing today. We are particularly encouraged that this hearing is being held by both the Aging Committee and the Human Rights Committee. I'm here today to give you a sociological peek of what aging in America's workforce looks like today. Both my legislative and social work background inform the creation of the radical age movement. Why, at this time, when age discrimination <coughs> has been around for eons, is this issue rising to the surface? One answer is longevity. Although affected by socioeconomic status, many of us are living longer and staying healthier longer than ever before. Older adults are not prepared to be retired, whatever that means, for 30 or 40 years. We don't want to and we can't afford to. Those extra years of life are not tacked on to the end of our lives. Rather, we have opened a new stage of life along the lifespan, roughly between the ages of 55 and 80. Older adults recognize this development, while the institutions and government of our country seem to have their heads buried in the sand. When it comes to ageism in the workforce, a person's performance cannot be judged by how old she is. We all age so differently. If I brought a dozen 80-year-olds to stand in front of you, I guarantee you would not be able to guess their age. As we age, we become more diverse than ever before. You would not put people who are 30 years old in the same category as people who are 60 years old. So why would we consign everyone over 65 to the category of senior or senior citizen? An active life does not end at 65 anymore. We are part of the future too. Younger seniors and leading edge boomers are desperately looking for jobs in an era when age discrimination in the workforce is rampant. In effect, older workers have had the workforce turn its back on them at a time when lo longevity is on the rise and Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid are being threatened. Instead of facing a secure future, we are threatened with the reality of living our final years in poverty. As a, so as a society, these conditions are not unlike the conditions that prevailed when Social Security was first introduced. A few months ago, Radical Age Movement co-sponsored a job fair for older adults and over 500 people showed up. That is just to say, that obviously, there's a problem out there. The first step on the journey to age justice is to create awareness of all the above. Ageism is so endemic to our society, even people who are the victims of this cruel prejudice often don't see it. They blame themselves for being old. Yet ageism <clears throat> perpetrated against older adults affects us all. Finally, we know there are laws and regulations at the federal, state, and local levels that inform us that nobody can be hired or fired based on their age. However, corporations and companies have been doing this forever. Undaunted by these laws, which are really scrutinized or enforced, they find every loophole possible in order to dismiss their seasoned and wise gray-headed workers. In some cases, their only rational explanation is that they want their companies to have a younger image. We know that not all social problems can be solved by legislature. Culture change can only come when the minds and hearts of people shift. This needs to come first before any kind of institutional change can come about. This is a goal of the radical age movement as a grassroots movement. The public and you, our legislators, need to understand once again that above all, ageism is a human rights issue. 
The Radical Age Movement has developed a policy agenda which is attached to my testimony. I thank you again for holding this historic hearing on age discrimination in the workforce. Thank you. Hi, my name is Steve Burkhardt. I'm a member of the Radical Age Movement. I'm also a professor of social work at the Silverman School of Social Work. Uh, Council Member Chin, I want to thank you for the, uh, uh, once again, uh, leading the way on the, uh, the fight against ageism. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to start with a, what I hope is something that comes out of this, but then I want to frame this discussion just a little bit differently as a challenge that I hope all the committee members here, not only who are council members, but all the staff who are here, will take something seriously back to um, your colleagues. Um, we obviously need a task force and a legislative package that emerges from this that is not simply for one year, but is for many years, given what, I, from the testimony that we've already heard, um, there's an endemic problem related to this at every level uh, related to the workforce itself and to age discrimination. Um, just as in addition to that, it would be, it would be great to see uh, the demographics on every city agency, not just private sector, uh, corporations, but also city agencies as well. That said, I want to frame this as something a little bit different. I'd like us all to pause for a second and ask a particular question. Why is it uh, you know, that if it were facts alone that would set us free, this legislative hearing wouldn't even be needed, and yet facts alone obviously are clearly not enough. For example, I'm struck by the fact that after the initial presentations that we have one council member left when everyone else left, when we of the community are now here to speak. I'm aware that DIFTA, uh, its actual budget is one that um, unendingly, unlike many city budgets, um, is confronted with soft money uh, on the basis of its, its actual funding. So that it always must deal with crumbs rather than a full slice of the pie. But the issue is why? And the reason is that ageism, uh, people have said, ageism is the powder puff oppression. It is hit with the, so if you call somebody an anti-Semitic or a racist or a sexist, inevitably they stand in shock. But if you call somebody as an ageist, like a powder puff, they go, oh, I never thought about that. <laughs> Such marginality comes from a mindset made up of, it speaks to a couple of qualities. One, people between the ages of 40 and 80 are embarrassed to say their age because of our internalized ageism. Secondly, it's convenient for politicians to pit old against young that reinforces the idea that intergenerational connectedness is impossible when in fact, as our speakers have already made clear, it certainly is. And the third is, the future is made up not just of the young, but of all of us. And until we embrace a future that belongs to everyone in this room and for this agenda, that the future is that we are all part of it, politicians will have the, the ability to easily thank us for our words and carry on with powder puff indifference to the reality of ageist oppression. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Jaime Bison, uh, and I'm uh, a member of the uh, Radical Age Movement. I came here with the intent of uh, touching more on the hearts of people, and I must applaud you for conducting this hearing. And I must say that discrimination uh, can come in different shapes and forms. And uh, being an immigrant, uh, I know better now because there are subtleties before and the lack of information, as you uh, pointed out before, that there is a need to define age discrimination. What is age discrimination? I think that's very important because, you know, uh, if we are in a, in a uh, if information is important, if we don't know much about it, then we'll not be properly guided. Um, there's so many things also that has been said and have been uh, eloquently stated amongst which were 
in terms of uh, the uh, the job fair, we're, we're actually raising the bar now. You, uh, something was mentioned about the job fair, the legal representation that is uh, required because at times people are inhibited to take the action because you know they feel the financial you know consequence of doing that. Uh, also, uh, conducting a senior uh, job fair and the, also the making avail uh, available the senior data to guide us, especially in the policy formulation. Um, I would not talk, take too much time on, on these things which have been stated before, but I, I just want to say that um, we have, the seniors of today created the future where we are in right now, and we are still co-creator of the future. We're not over the hill yet. We're still productive, and we're able and able. And so anyone who says that we have no right to even get engaged is wrong, flatly wrong, because we have gardened enough experience in our lifetime that can help the future generation or the generations of today, because ageism is universal. No one is exempted from it. We are here right now as seniors, but the people who are not in that generation will become part of it as well. So what we do now is, I've always believed uh, that public officials have been, have been motivated to run for office to go over and beyond their uh, interest. And I, and I also know that most of my friends who are in politics, they said, you know, uh, at times, you know, you have to compromise when you're in politics because it's, it's, uh, it's totally different when you're in the implementation uh, uh, stage. But I, I say also that whenever we do these things, we have to always look back on where we started, how we started in entering this, uh, in entering public service. Let us not forget in our hearts that where we started because we are here to go beyond our own interests as public servants. And if I may also say that the seniors has the uh, numbers and as the re reliability factor to make a difference and to, make, to ensure that we will remember and we will take action on people we have supported our interests, and we also have the power to disengage ourselves with people who have not worked in our interests. And so in closing, I just want to say that please take it in your hearts how you started in uh, public service, and let's not uh, lose track of that. And all of us, our members, are part of the community, and everyone is expected to do their share, not only the politicians, but the public as well. And so we, let's spread the word that every, everything else, everyone else should be involved, and it's only in our involvement that we can achieve justice for all. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kristen Roars. I'm a master's in social work student at Hunter College Silverman School of Social Work. I'm an intern at the Radical Age Movement and on the Intergenerational Committee at Radical Age. I'm here today on behalf of Joseph D. Benedetto, who's the chair of the Radical Age's Intergenerational Committee. He was the MSW intern last year, and he's currently on the Radical Age's Steering Committee. He's currently interning at the New York Civil Liberties Union, which is where he is today. We both just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak and have this conversation be public. We highly support and recommend Councilwoman Chin's job training and employment program focusing on older workers. The program could assist older New Yorkers in finding meaningful jobs that are consistent with their experience and skill set. And on a selfish note, I want to work at a job in a, an environment where there's older adults and their joy and their wisdom and their just their presence. And just a final note, a direct statement from Joseph. He says, ageism, like all mechanisms of oppression, is embedded in our social institutions and cultures. 
However, while ageism is just as pervasive as other isms, it does not share the same historical context and is often unseen. So with careful examination, we can unveil ageism. Thank you. No, no clapping in the chamber. You want to clap through this, OK? Thank you. Hello, my name is Denise Hunter, and I'm 60 years of age, and I'm a member of the Radical Age Movement. Um, my story is I've been an educator for many, many years, 14 years, and an adjunct math professor. And my son, who is now 40 years of age, he got sick with multiple sclerosis. So I had to put my career on the side and dedicate myself to him because people who are aware of elderly and disabled, they don't get treated the way they supposed to or get the necessary help. So I had to dedicate myself to my son. But I also at the same time get enjoyment in teaching. So I decided to make myself competitive. As one person said, you have to go back to school as an elderly person and make yourself competitive with the younger generation. But there is definitely a trend because when I went back to Brooklyn College to receive my master's in mathematics and elementary education, I had a problem of getting a student teaching position in which I shouldn't have had to do a student teaching position because I had over 24, 25 years of teaching experience. And you put me in a classroom with younger teachers and then for no reason they say, oh no, we don't need her here at student teaching. Or, no, she's a conflict with things. That's not fair. Because when you're older, you have life experience, you have history, and you have the ability to, to lead. So therefore, when I hear and understand about ageism, it is, I think, about bullying. I think about diversity. I think about bullying because the way testing is done now to eliminate the older population is basically the terminology. So therefore, when an older person comes into a job position and they've been doing all of these things and by you not being able to articul articulate yourself with the modern technology, automatically you see that there's an age difference. Then when we talk about diversity, we want to accept the LBG committee, um, we, we want to accept economically deprived people. We want to accept social involvement of an inclusion of everybody or ethnic groups. We have to include in diversity the older generation because with the older generation, we bring a commitment we bring experience and we have so much to share and lead the younger generation, not the younger generation leading the older generation. Then when you talk about employment and all of these agencies, these agencies are not updated because people who are going to these agencies who are older, we are not at the bottom level. We are up here. So therefore the services and opportunities that they offer, we cannot benefit from it. So what I'm saying, and I'm, I'm so happy to learn that I'm not the only one out there facing certain things and didn't know where, how, what you call it until I met Steve who was involved with the ageism. And then I said, oh, me too. And just like the other lady, when we talked about a number of applicants, there need to be a criteria because I called and wanted, and they said over the telephone, no, we cannot take that. It's not that. But listening to everything here today, it was age discrimination through testing, through um, just, just the, in other words, I'm finding that they camouflage the aging through different channels to say that it's not ageism, but definitely ageism does exist. Thank you. Thank you for your, your testimony. We're going to call up the next panel. Uh, Sarah Safford, Madeline Gear, 
Caitlin Horsey, Chris Modello, and uh, Regina Cooper. Please begin, and make sure you identify yourself for the record. Okay, I'm Sarah Stafford. Uh, press the button. Hello, I'm Sarah Stafford. I'm here to testify for about um, age discrimination in one of the city agencies, the New York City Department of Education, the Office of Adult and Continuing Education, um, which is where I worked for up until 2015. And, um, this, you know, we've spoken about this at another hearing with the City Council on Education, but we thought it would be great to talk about it here as well. Um, I worked at the Office of Anel and Continuing Education, retired early after the program took a downturn when Rosemary Mills took over as superintendent. And she set a tone in the organization that drove many people away, um, including our principal first, and then instructional facilitators, and then a host of other teachers who were forced out or harassed and given uh, U ratings that were leading people to, to leave in frustration or to be worried about not being able to get a, a raise or to be able to be pushed out. So many of the senior staff were given these U ratings for the first time in their careers when this woman came in as the superintendent. And in, in the history of the program, this had never happened before. And U ratings can be leading to dismissal or to disqualify a teacher for the increase in salary. And since the salaries make up a large part of the budget, it seemed like there was a concerted effort to get rid of older teachers as a way of saving money. There were grievances filed, and I believe that this was, um, there were cases of age discrimination that were going on. And this is a program that serves many older people as well. Um, so it's a great program. I feel like it really needs to be investigated so that the, the services for the other older adults that are trying to get education and improve their skills and a lot of them were job seeking as well and this was a program that I really would have liked to keep working in myself. I didn't experience age discrimination myself but I witnessed it with many of my colleagues. Can I just ask you a question on that? Um, did any of your colleague or kind of raise this issue with the New York City Human Rights Commission? I believe some of them filed grievances with the EOC, yeah. Okay, we can check on that. Thank you. They wanted to just like set up their, I think testify with her. Oh, okay. Right now, yeah. Okay, Do uh, we also have Donna Corral and Betty Godfrey. Okay. I'm just asking, because I'm giving background information. I'm, I'm from way back when. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm really going to be brief. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Betty Gottfried. I co-founded the Adult Education Chapter more than 50 years ago, and I served as its chapter leader for over 40 years. At the request of subsequent chapter leaders, I have served as a resource person to the chapter since my retirement. 
During my tenure as chapter leader, a minimum number of teachers received end-of-year U ratings. Some years, there were no U ratings. There were always some U ratings on observations, but because the majority of the leadership and the support staff were hired from within the program, there was usually a genuine attempt to give support to these teachers. Since the advent of Super Mil Superintendent Mill's administration, a wave of U ratings has hit the program like a tsunami out of control. The U-rated teachers who contacted me for advi advice all had the same thing in common. They were over the age of 50 and they were on the, the upper end of the salary scale. Many of these teachers also had something else in common. They had built the adult education program which had evolved from a group of great society programs that were formed in the 60s and 70s in response to the demands of the civil rights movement. They created curriculum and participated in professional organizations. Some were prize winners for their co contributions to the field. The administration also drove several senior teachers out of the program by creating impossible schedules for them to work. The tactics of these tactics severely dis diminished the number of full-time staff, which sharply reduced the number of teachers who were entitled to the negotiated benefits that had brought adult ed in line with K through 12. We spent about 30 years doing that. M many of these teachers are now gone. I firmly believe that the underlying agenda that drives this pattern of behavior is to dismantle the hard-earned benefits for which adult ed fought and to minimize the importance of the population that OECE serves. Disrespect for teachers is tantamount to disrespect for students. We urge you to help us to redress these grievances and make always a CFIable program again. It would be hard to explain to you how much effort we put into this. When we became part of the Board of Ed and part of the United Federation of Teachers, we were as much like civil rights workers as we were like teachers. We served a lot of people on public assistance. We have served people who we are a poverty program. We can only hold our classes or when in the poor areas of the city. We serve a very important population. Our program is reduced in half from what it was several years ago. And all of the experienced teachers are being driven out by the way that I have expressed in this. And really, they are, they are returning us to a procession program with teachers working part time, and we're losing many, many students. Um, my name is Dana Kuro. Um, Press I'm the button on the speaker. Oh, still not here. Here it is. My name is Dana Kuro. I was a chapter leader in the year 2016 and 2017 for the um, Department of Education, New York City um, Program of Adult and Continuing Education. Um, one of my responsibilities as a chapter leader was to represent teachers at their disciplinary meetings with the principals. Often a teacher would be informed that a letter was being placed in her file initiating a process that may lead to the loss of employment. In 2016-2017 school year when I was a chapter leader, I averaged four such disciplinary meetings a month. Uh, given the fact that I was only allotted three hours twice a week to act as a chapter leader, most of my time advocating for the teachers was spent on these difficult, often teacher bashing and humiliating meetings. Uh, some of the infractions for which teachers were being written up and threatened with losing their jobs included failure to decorate bulletin boards on time, failure to use a word chart during instruction, excessive ab absence after only two days, since most of these problems could have been resolved with a conversation between the supervisors and the teachers, uh, the extra heavy-handed approach that Ms. Mills' administration took, took seemed excessive and abusive. I will add that the majority of the teachers I had to represent were over 50 years old. I can only recollect one young mother who was being disciplined for being out too frequently after sustaining injuries in a car accident. Personally, I had to endure surprise visits by Ms. Mills and her staff as well. On one such visit, six administrators, six, entered my classroom. My principal, assistant principal, Superintendent Mills with another person from central office, 
our staff developer and a counselor. All sat with somber expressions without in introductions, without any recognitions of my adult students. After 20 minutes, they all left without saying a word. The next day, it was reported to me that Ms. Mills engaged in a screaming session at my principal and the AP after visiting my class. Intimidation and scare tactics do not make for better teachers or improvement of instruction. In fact, after that visit, I lost some of my students who chose never to come back to our program. That was the day I decided to go into early retirement. Please help our teachers and save our wonderful program. Hello, my name is Lejaira Cooper, and I represent SAGE and the Radical Age Movement. And as I am, as one can see, an African-American woman. What is invisible is I'm 70 years old and a lesbian, and in my life, I've had more challenges as a strong woman than as a lesbian. I'm also a master's candidate in English and creative writing. Unfortunately, the position of strength is not does not necessarily exist for older adults. And although this is not a hearing about the LGBT community, age discrimination works against us as well. Some of the things I've noticed is older adults face substantial challenges. Access is one. Seniors need better resources for food, health, and transportation. Our community has many needs. We need better health care and food resources for individuals on low budgets who question whether to get medical treatment or eat. Professionally, we need to be seen as full functioning adults. We need better information about the availability of government services, and we need better transportation access. We have all these new lower buses, and they need to pull into the sidewalk when they can. Getting around the city using subways can be harrowing for seniors because elevators or escalators are out of service, and there are not enough of them. For some, of our, some, for some of us, our jobs pay too low because of our identity, be it gender and or color, and the higher level of discrimination in the workplace that ex existed in the past. Unfortunately, in housing and workplace, ageist discrimination is still an issue today. Racial and economic disparities hinder how communities age. As a younger person, I, was never, I never thought of this. As a woman and as a person of color growing up, I had no images that were positive, which is now the, pretty much the same issue for seniors. Every image reimposed negativity about who we were or are. And until the black movement was born in the 60s, I did not see people who were like me represented positively. As I said, the same is now true of seniors. So today, we are here to say, as they would say at SAGE, we are not invisible. As older adults, we stand together for a respectful and dignified ageist free community, and now is the time to march, protest, write, and as I wrote for the American Ethical Union, to learn about folks supposedly different from our clan, whichever ones we claim. Thank you. My name is Caitlin Hosey. I'm here representing Live On New York. So thank you first for holding this hearing. And actually, September is Senior Center Month. So happy Senior Center Month to everybody here. Um, prior to illuminating the very real challenges that often exist for older adults in the workplace, we want to start off with the basic fact that aging is, in fact, a life process. That 75 is not the same as 95 nor are 45 and 75 monolithic experiences to be benchmarked by the same standard of events that will happen for everybody. For some, for some older adults, aging might mean a retirement that you have worked so hard for and long awaiting for. For others, it's a second career choice. It's a, it's a new act of sorts. And for many, it's the continued economic struggles that have been faced all of your life but only feel exacerbated today. This economic reality means that many older adults simply cannot afford the fiscal implications of a frequently aged bias and often discriminatory society. Even beyond economic pressures, older adults should not be shunted the opportunity to fulfill the seemingly innate desire to produce, be a part of society, and to contribute. 
Unfortunately, working in opposition of the often economic or personal desires, it has been found that three out of five older workers have experienced age discrimination in the workplace. Though highly underreported, we are certain that this number as has been illuminated today is much higher. For already marginalized populations such as older women, immigrants, or minority communities, these age-related injustices only serve to exacerbate existing inequities. Inequities such as lost wages due to caregiving, time off for child rearing, persistent wage gap, especially for women, and a lack of pension options for a multitude of workers means that the financial margins for older adults are often so slim that a setback due to age discrimination is just unacceptable and can have lasting consequences. It's critical that we, as a society, address the root, justice, the root causes of these injustices. We need older adults to be recognized for their strengths, many of which are sought after in today's workforce, such as reliability, commitment, a strong work ethic, low turnover. These are all of the strengths that older adults bring to the table. We at Live On New York are appreciative of the opportunity to change the narrative around the value of older adults and older workers. We support the council's call to better support older adults who experience age discrimination in the workplace and everywhere. Further, it's important that not only opportunities exist, but that older adults are aware of these opportunities as has been highlighted today. The programs such as CSEP, which was mentioned, run through the Department for the Aging, is critical and valuable and we need seniors to know about it. Even further, I'm gonna actually leave you with a quick example. Um, a Starbucks actually in Mexico City recently on their own accord saw a community need um, for seniors to have jobs and they started making changes within their own workplace to uh, change to a six hour work day, a lower um, stool so that way the counter wasn't too high for people to try and grab things. They made these conscious decisions to employ older adults and to make their work environment friendly for all of that. We believe that that initiative that was taken in that one example can be replicated throughout this city, throughout the United States, and we want everybody to come to the table and to try and come up with these innovative solutions, and we welcome that opportunity to make New York a better place to age, whether it be through public, private, citizen engagement. We really look forward to this continued dialogue. Thank you. Chairwoman Chen, good to see you. Thank you so much for uh, this uh, historic hearing and the opportunity to testify here today. You have my written testimony, so I'm going to skip uh, a large portion of it. Uh, my name is Chris Widello. I'm the Associate State Director for AARP here in New York City. And on behalf of our uh, over 800,000 members uh, in New York City, we appreciate this opportunity to be here. And thank you to my many volunteers that took the time to be here. And, a number of them, um, you may hear from a few of them later on, and uh, some of them have been directly impacted uh, by age discrimination. Um, but you can tell that they, they certainly care about this issue. So uh, ARP, and I provided a copy, uh, released a national survey last year and uh, of adults 45 years and older. So it's not just an issue for seniors, it is really about people as they age. And uh, lo we looked at folks 45 and older and 61% of those respondents said they have either seen or experienced age, age discrimination in the workplace. And 38% of those believe that the practice is, is very common. Older women, African Americans, Hispanics, and those who are unemployed were more likely to feel they were the subject of discrimination. And you cited some statistics from a New York City specific report that we released back in 2014. It's also worth noting that when compared to younger workers, older adults receive fewer job offers, search for work for weeks longer, and are less likely to find reemployment after losing a job. In 2017, the Georgia Institute of Technology Social School of Psycho Psychology and University of Minnesota's Carlson School of Management analyzed the U.S. government's 2014 Displaced Workers Survey. The researchers found that someone 50 years or older is likely to be unemployed for 5.8 5 .8 weeks longer than someone between the ages of 30 and 49, and 10.6 weeks longer than people between the ages of 20 and 29. The study also found that the odds of being reemployed decreased by 2.6% for each one year increase in age. 
While New York State has some of the most comprehensive age discrimination laws in the country, the Supreme Court has made age discrimination more difficult to prove, both in terms of statutory language and how the language has been interpreted by the courts. In many respects, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act has become a second-class civil rights law, providing older workers far less protections than other civil rights laws. Too often over the years, the Supreme Court has failed to interpret the ADEA as a remedial statute, but instead narrowly interpreted its pr uh, protections and broadly construed its exceptions. There's still a great deal that can be done. Uh, AARP has a few recommendations, um, a number of, you know, of policy recommendations to curb further age discrimination. Make age-related inquiries and, specif and specifications pr presumptively unlawful would be a good first start. Reinforce that practices like maximum experience requirements and requirements for applicants to be affiliated with a university are age-related. Bar requests for date of birth, graduation dates, or similar information unless age is bona fide occupational qualification. And prohibit uh, practices of online job sites and others that require entry of age to complete an application. Use drop-down menus that contain age-based cutoff dates or utilize selection criteria or algorithms that have the effect of screening out older applicants. AARP New York recommends that the New York City Council through the Committee on Aging and the Committee on Civil, right, Civil and Human Rights convene a task force to look at the ways New York City can further strengthen policy and practices aimed at eliminating age discrimination. We ask that the work group report out actionable steps the city can take to address age discrimination through legislation or regulation, outreach, education, and best practices. Um, Really appreciate all those that had the chance to testify today and share their perspective on this issue. Uh, I think one, th one of the takeaways is this is larger than a job fair for seniors or a couple jobs that are directed towards seniors, right? This is about how we change the practice of businesses because there's a business case to be made on this. This is just good business for employers. There is a coming up soon, a, very, a shortage in y enough younger workers to do these jobs. Um, you know, the, the, one of the stories that I like is uh, today if NASA wanted to send somebody to the moon, they can't do it without starting from scratch. All that institutional lost knowledge is gone because all these boomers who were part of the space program have retired and are, are long gone. That was all experiences that they've had. So we need to sh see, the sh uh, businesses need to see the value in this and organizations need to see the value in this because they are going to have to hire older workers sooner or later, but are they prepared to meet those needs? And they are sometimes unique needs. Uh, but we need to, uh, I think, uh, break down barriers where, where, ages, where we're seeing a lot of age discrimination in the workplace. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for testifying. I think we have one more panel. Yes. Rosa Hardy, Lisette Velez, Betty Wong, and Daryl Thompson. Anyone else that wish to testify? Uh, you can fill out a form. You can begin. Identify yourself for the record. Please. Thank you very much. My name is Rosa Harding. I was born in, uh, I am representing to Sunnyside Community Service. I was born in Ecuador on July 19, 1943. I came for the first time to the senior center when I had 45 years because I was sick and later returned because I left my invalid and I could no longer walk which exacerbates in therapy and turned it to work, although I didn't already work. Then I returned to my beloved center, Sunnyside Community Service. Since then, I have been working as a volunteer, helping in the center and the community. Two years ago, some colleagues and I told the needy children have to learn about nutrition, so learning to eat properly, since I put myself as example, that but no knowing how to feed my well, no knowing much about nutrition. I got diabetes stage two. 
Sometimes my sugar goes up 650 or 720. I have the four being in intensive care. Hence my desire to help with the children so they don't get sick, no or heat problems, diabetes or obesity. Then we create a program called Youth and Adults. In this first program, I was working with a Colombian boy who did know English. For me, it was a wonderful experience to work with him because I could help translation and teaching to do the work. Also, it was for me as if I have, I sit in my hands which you have to grow, taking care of him with much love, and that way my little seed gave me a beautiful fruit to which I could see him last year, and so the wonderful results that God obtained because my child had eaten a great change, managing to learn English, overcome their shyness, entering the world of music, which is what he liked, and that was a great satisfaction for me because they followed me advice, overcoming all obstacles and becoming a successful person, teaching him to never surrender, that to achieve something in life. One has to walk ever forward, never go back or take monument. The benefits I got from this experience and work with the children were invaluable. Uh, the, the, for the courage, the coordination, and collaboration of children. Also, I learned children's respect for each other, and I'm also so happy, and I want to continue to fight for the program and continue spreading it, and want the program to become the program number one about helping children. Thank you. Madam Chair, good afternoon, council members. My name is Daryl Thompson. I'm a disabled United States Air Force veteran, Brooklyn Tech graduate, an NYU graduate, and I will soon be graduating from Columbia University for my master's in technology management. My IT career began in 1981. I say this because I have been there on the ground to see the evolution of technology. I'm not a programmer. I'm not a developer, I do not design applications, I design infrastructure. My background, to summarize, for my undergraduate thesis, I wrote a thesis on cloud computing before cloud computing hit the street. That was 2010. My present thesis is to design a portal so that veterans going through the Chapter 31 program can receive the proper documentation compiled so that when they go to their counselor, they just give a pamphlet to say, this is my path. I wish the other council members were here when they were discussing the impact of job fairs and critique about resumes, et cetera, and so forth. This is a short pack of positions that I tried to apply for within city government going as far back as 2014. My last application was for chief of staff for the veteran services. I've yet to hear back. When I was in my early years of my career, when you wanted to go to another position, you just simply added the collective impact of your experience onto your resume. It wasn't until I graduated from NYU in 2011 that I now had to revise my resume. This is the 457th revision 457th revision of my resume. The only changes is that I finished my undergraduate degree and I'm now finishing my master's degree. Respectfully, I cannot find any other way to say the exact same thing. But yet when I submit my resume online, it comes back within a matter of hours, if not minutes, sorry but. There isn't a job fair I have not attended in the last 15 years, both sponsored by the VA, by NYU, by Columbia, by my high school. It is the impact that, insofar as technology is concerned, if you're not up on the latest terminologies, et cetera, and so forth, then you're no longer marketable. 
I am here to say that does not exist. The problem is, as I've been hearing from other people earlier today, is that when you file your resume, you have to get it past what has been called in the lexicon as the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers are HR generalists between the ages of 29 and 34, who for whatever reason, when they were going to the undergraduate degrees, were in marketing and somehow made the transition from marketing to human resources. I find that incredible. When I have to display and explain the breadth of my background to someone who is a little bit younger than, say, my niece, and they look at me with incredulous looks, can I Google that? I had an HR generalist from a top financial firm ask me, could she Google one of the employers that I worked for? I don't understand, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like lost. It's like, okay, I have a graduate degree. I have a graduate degree from one of the top universities on the planet, yet I've been on the bench since 2015. I worked for the city. I was a contract employee for the Department of Buildings. I re-engineered the inventory control process. It took five months for the CIO to recognize that I was on her staff. Three weeks to make the plates, four days to relieve me of my post. After I submitted the plates, after I redesigned the application. This is an ongoing trend. When they say, cut back on your resume because that will show your age. Well, if I'm applying for CIO, and I only show positions going as far back as the early 2000s, when the average tenure of a CIO to make that position is nominally between the low end of 17 to the high end of 25 years, how can I compete? How many different ways can I write my resume to explain the exact same thing? How many different schools must I go to to prove that I have the acumen, the experience, the tenacity, the focus to do the job? I live off my pension. I live off my disability pension. I used to live in Park Slope before Park Slope became Park Slope. I now live in public housing because my position was downsized in the early 2000s. That's when I decided to go back to school. So for the measure of seniors cannot do the job, I will be walking across the podium at Columbia University next May at the young age of 59. I went back to school at 41. There is a problem, a progressive, almost nauseating problem that because you cannot articulate the scope and breadth of today's technology that you're considered redundant. Simple assessment. My platform used to be what they called the AS400. It was a legendary platform back in the 80s, early 90s. Everyone in here has a MetroCard. Maybe a few people in here use what they call the Easy Pass. When you run your MetroCard through the turnstile or the easy pass reads on the highway, it processes through a bank of AS400s sitting in the old, I believe it is the Madison Square Garden building over on 12th Avenue. There's a battery of AS400s in there. But yet, in the early 2000s, I lost my job because society said that platform was being phased out. IBM revamped that platform, it's now called the Power Systems. My lane is technology management, not applications. I'm 59 years old. I have 20, maybe 25 good years to give. I am not competing with 30-year-olds. I am not competing with 40-year-olds. I put, put me in front of a CIO let him or her read my resume. I guarantee you within five minutes they'll say, we, they'll be the ones saying, this is where we can use you. 
Resumes of our caliber have to go in the hands of the people making the decision. You send it to HR, it's a waste of time. You send it through a job portal, it's a waste of effort. Because algorithms, as people have already spoken, will screen through the resumes, they will look at the years, they'll trace back. You cut off years, there's certain jobs that will say, well, you don't have enough experience. So where do you do? What do you, what, what, you know, what's the other recourse? There isn't a version of a resume that I haven't written in the last 15 years. My CV is nine pages long. Nine. I can put 20 years, 25, 30 years of my resume onto two pages that a very bright first year grad student can read and digest. But yet, it never reaches the person making the decision. Going to job fairs are pointless. I say that respectfully, pointless. If you are over the age of 45, especially in technology, you're over the age of 45, you're wasting your time going to a job fair. You're wasting your time. You can write it on the most profound resume paper there is, get it reviewed by two steps below God. If you're not between 30 and 35, minimum five different accreditations, CISA, CISIP, et cetera, you just wasted your afternoon. This has to stop. There are thousands of people just like me who can walk into an agency, a department, and all we have to do is find out what needs to be done, who do we report to, what is our budget, what is our timeline, and we can hit the ground running. I've done it more than a few times. I consciously refuse to rewrite my resume yet again. The only thing more that I would probably have to do if it was required, since I am graduating from an Ivy League school with a graduate degree, I mean, the next thing higher is to get a PhD from, a, from an Ivy League school. What impact would that make? Because on the resume, as far as HR is concerned, you're too old, you're irrelevant, your technology skills are out of date, et cetera and so forth. Again, I'm not a programmer. I don't design applications. I could rewire this entire building, give you biometrics, give you Star Trek stuff. All I need to know is the budget. This has to stop. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, I do with an echo. Hi, my name is Liz Ethelas, and thank you, Chair um, Chen and fellow committee members. I appreciate you standing and freezing along with us because it is freezing in this room. <laughs> As I sit here, I was looking up at the sign saying, a government of the people, by the people, for the people. I don't see it being exclusive to a certain sect of people. And I feel as though my people, my peer, have been excluded from the people. And I'm really disappointed. I'm disappointed on, on many levels because as somebody who is a true New Yorker, I've contributed to, to scaffolding to, so it could be there from when I got to this point. And i very, very disappointed. But I wanted to address a question you had asked one of the, uh, the commissioners here, one of the, you had asked to define age discrimination. Because there's two types of age discrimination when it comes to employment. So it's one in getting hired, such as this, sir, uh, this gentleman had described, and I totally concur with everything he said and all my other peers. But there's also the discrimination of once you get through the doors. And you've met that quota. And they used the words quota freely and openly. And then you fear Am I going to miss the quota when the next person is hired? And then you do. I've worked with several New York City agencies. I've worked with the Department of Education, where I've witnessed firsthand 
the discrimination of experienced tenured teachers who are so valued. Um, I, and my kids went to the, um, to the specialized high schools, Stuyvesant, Bronx Science. I worked with the, in the chancellor's office and I personally experienced where t I heard behind closed doors administrators saying, why would I get one teacher when I can get three for the price of one? That's highly insulting, especially when they're educating my sons or my teachers or my fellow doctor or my future doctor or that's highly insulting. I've worked with the uniform agency with the fire department in which I was fired. I went to the civil service process and the first thing I was told the first day of work, I was hired by somebody who I didn't work directly with and this is part of the problem too. So I was hired and as soon as I got through the door, the person who was my immediate supervisor said amongst the persons who, uh, while the persons who had hired me were standing there, and several times after that, I didn't think they were gonna hire somebody who was gonna retire much before me. I was shocked. And that was not the welcoming I was hoping to receive. And it, was, it seems like I'm constantly trying to prove myself, although I do have the credentials, in experience, in education, um, and in knowledge. But it continues to fail me. I recently, again, I went through another full with civil service process. I'm, my numbers are high in, in the process, mind you, but I went to, again and I, I was hired by the Department of Health. At the Department of Health, I was really discriminated. So there it, let me tell you my full name. My full name is Lisette Vélez de Intriago. So there are many levels of discrimination. It's not just limited to age discrimination, but when you throw that into the basket, alongside the ethnicity, the gender, and everything else, it just keeps on piling up and it bewilders the employee who's trying to conserve and do as best as possible as they can do. Um, I'm also went through the process of EEOs and and filing for uh, these some of these agencies like agencies these agencies and I saw that the whole process is very bewildering and I'm really disappointed that they couldn't describe what age discrimination is they couldn't give you the stats that you requested although they knew they were going to sit here at this hearing they couldn't give you the numbers or the verification that we're supposed to provide or we ask for, but, and you, our representatives, are not following up on, forgive me for saying so. But I think there has to be more accountability. Um, I see the word being used usely as in terms of accountability, but it's not being followed through. There's a facade. So let me tell you what um, discrimination looks like once you're inside and you've been hired. Examples of age discrimination is an increased workload, unrealistic time frames, isolation from teams, isolation from meetings, isolation from emails, and so forth. That's different from colleagues with like titles, like terms of employment, like terms of seniority. Um, why are people such as us being held to different standards from others who are younger than us? And why are we not being respected in the workplace for our experiences, for our scaffolding, and for what we have to contribute, um, our wisdom that we've grown throughout the years. I thank you uh, for taking the time to listen and I'm hoping this doesn't drop here and I'm hoping this continues because I am disappointed and I think it's a growing population, there's a growing population and this room was full, full, but yet the temperature went down, people had to leave because they're frozen. Your council members didn't even stay for the longevity of this hearing. That's sad. That is very, very sad because we vote, we watch, and I thank you.
We will definitely follow up. I mean, uh, there's so much work to do. And this is the first hearing that we had on age discrimination in the workplace. So we will follow up with the agency, you know, with um, statistics and information they're supposed to give us. And working with uh, the advocates, the radical age movement, we are going to work on legislations and programs and policies. So this is only the beginning for us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair, Chairwoman Chin, thank you very much for sticking it out uh, as the sweep. I have, uh, my name is Betty Wong. I'm uh, the co-founder of Stage Two Startups. It's actually an organization focusing on helping, um, we thought, uh, mid-career people to become entrepreneurs. At first we thought it was older people, but then it, we found out that it's really mid-career people because we found out that age discrimination is now starting uh, at the age of 35. <laughs> um, so let me just tell you uh, three quick stories, and I'll end with something hopeful. Uh, the first story is uh, an event that I attended. I was actually listening to some millennial CEOs talk about hiring baby boomers. Uh, the young woman who was a CEO said, you know, the other day I had to hire this boomer, uh, and she did not know how to use Google Docs. And now she's trying to figure out how to use Google Docs. How can we hire these people? And how can we rely on them if they can't use technology? To, to Mr. Thompson's point. Uh, actually, I'm pretty sure she probably learned how to use Google Docs. But that was followed up by another uh, millennial CEO who said, well, I really have to say that I hired a boomer, and she worked out really well. And now I don't have to worry about a lot of stuff because I didn't have to teach her anymore. She actually knew what to do. Uh, so I don't have to worry when I'm out of the office. Uh, this is followed by a conversation I had with a venture capitalist here in New York City. He was talking about ageism actually out in uh, Palo Alto. He said, we went to visit an unemployment office near Stanford. And do you know what I saw in that unemployment office? A whole bunch of scientists who were 40 and over, and they were all unemployed. They had been replaced by scientists in their 20s and 30s. So uh, I actually was an entrepreneur. And New York City being an entrepreneurial city, I want to point out that I've actually helped people to raise money. I've tried to help people. I've actually tried to raise money myself. And if you go to visit many of the accelerators and incubators in the city, what you will see, um, and no offense to them because I'm sure they're all brilliant, are a lot of young, white, men running their great companies. You don't see older people. You don't see women, not too many. You don't see people of color. They are missing from the entrepreneurial community. As a matter of fact, three days ago, actually last week, Steve Case was up at Columbia University saying that 90% of the money given to startups are actually given to white men. Less than 10% are given to women less than 1% are given to people of color. So as a founder of an organization trying to help more people who are middle-aged and older to become startups, uh, startup founders, uh, we would like to reach out to the council. I'm sorry Ben Kalos left because he and I have had several conversations about this and he is my councilman. Um, what I would love to do is to work with the city council to try to get more people who are older, who have experience, who have resources, who have networks, to develop their own companies where they can hire people who have experience, who can appreciate people who have experience. And that is actually my parting thought. So thank you very much for sticking it out. Thank you so much for testifying. I think that's a uh, look forward to talking with you. I think there's a report that's coming out about entrepreneurship. So uh, we should definitely also explore that. Yes, Harvard and Inc. Magazine reported that the more successful companies are actually companies started by people 45 and older. That came out earlier this year. Great. Um, wanted to thank everyone for testifying today. Uh, we will definitely follow up. It's a lot of work to do, but this is only the beginning. So thank you again.
Hearing is adjourned.